video, I wanted to tell you about something that is also a unique feature of fluids in micro and nano scale channels. So if I take a beaker and I take another beaker and I connect them together with a very small tube, let's say a glass capillary tube that has a diameter on the order of nanometers to micrometers, so pretty small. And I fill both of them with salt water. And then I stick some wires in the beakers. And then I connect them with a voltage. An interesting thing happens. So I should point out that my voltage here needs to be something like greater than a kilovolt per centimeter my electric field. If I do this setup, an interesting thing happens. And I, if I look at this fluid under a microscope, what I'll see is flow. I'll actually see fluid moving from right to left in this system. And I will see over time the beaker on the left hand side getting more full and the beaker on the right hand side getting less full. And the question is, why would I see this? What's going on? Well, there's actually two things happening. One is the phenomenon that we call electrophoresis, and the other is a phenomenon we call electroosmosis. So let's take a look at electrophoresis first. So if I have a setup similar to what I just showed you, so two beakers connected together with a small glass tube, and I put my battery up here, what I want to do is I want to zoom in to a particular region here, and if I zoom in, this is what I would see. I would see ions that are positively charged going to the left, going to the negative electrode, and I would see ions that are negatively charged going to the right, towards the positive electrode. So this general phenomenon of charged ions or any sort of charged molecule migrating through a solvent is called electrophoresis. And if you've heard the term DNA electrophoresis, then that's essentially the same phenomenon. DNA happens to be a negatively charged molecule that gets dragged through a gel with an electric field. So it's the same idea. So electrophoresis is simply the motion of ions relative to a solvent due to an external electric field. So how do we calculate how fast these ions are actually moving? Well, to do that, we need to calculate, we want to calculate the velocity of an ion, I. And to do that, we need to know something called mu EP. And mu EP is the electrophoretic mobility of the ion. And then we also need to know the strength of the electric field, E. And again, the electric field is typically on the order of kilovolts per centimeter. So they're typically pretty high, pretty strong electric fields. But the distances we're dealing with are short on the order of nanometers to micrometers to millimeters. And so as a result, the voltages we end up using are typically pretty, can be pretty small for this. But let's talk about electrophoretic mobility. How do we calculate that? Well, to calculate electrophoretic mobility, we need to know a few things. We need to know Z sub I times E. So Z sub I times E is the net charge on ion I. So I would need to know something about the ion in my solution. Is it a sodium ion? Is it a chlorine ion? What's the charge? And E is then the charge of an electron, the unit charge of an electron. And then I would divide that by F sub I. And F sub I is called the friction coefficient of ion I. And F sub I is the, is the same concept as the, the, the Stokes equation that we used in the diffusion lecture to calculate the diffusion coefficient. So the friction coefficient is a function of the radius of the ion, so how, how big it is. And we can actually calculate that, F sub I, is equal to 6 pi times the radius of ion I, and then times nu, which is the solvent viscosity. 
So the, fu the friction coefficient is a function of both the radius or the size of the ion as well as the solvent viscosity. Now what this means though is that if I have an ion that has twice the charge but that's also uh, twice the size of a smaller ion with half the charge, they'll both migrate at the same, the same speed. So electrophoresis is the movement of charged ions in my, in my tube. And so this doesn't necessarily result in bulk fluid flow. Electrophoresis is actually the smaller of the two phenomenon, the less, the less, um, the less important of the two phenomenon. But it's still important and worth discussing. So the main points for electrophoresis, the first is that ions of different size migrate at the same speed as long as the channel size is large relative to the ion size. All right? So in other words, as long as the, 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 the walls are farther away with respect to the ions. So these would all be moving to the left hand side using our setup from previously. So I would expect my, ion, my positively charged ions to move to the left if I have my negative potential over there and my positive potential over here. Notice that um, these ions that are stuck to the wall do not move. Remember, this is called the stern layer, and those ions are fixed and they do not move in an applied electric field. Now, if we shrink the shrink the size of our channel and make it much smaller, and by small we mean nanometer size, large would be micrometer size and greater, if we shrink our channel and it starts to approach the size of our ions or even a few multiples of the size of our ions, what can happen is our ions can actually get stuck in gaps in the stern layer and when they do that they don't move because now they're electrostatically attracted to the wall and so they tend not to want to flow and so if I'm looking at this with a microscope what I'll see is the smaller ions zip on through the channel but the larger ions tend to get stuck and move much slower so as a result I'm actually separating my ions I'm getting a separation between the large and small ions simply as a result of the channel size Okay. So that's electrophoresis. Let's take a look at electroosmosis. Now electroosmosis is responsible for the the more responsible for the bulk flow that I observe than electrophoresis, but they both contribute to the overall motion. Now, if I zoom in to my channel, what I see is something like this. I've got my channel and I've got my stern layer. So I have my layer of ions that are fixed, essentially fixed to the wall. But then remember, outside of my stern layer, I have what's called the diffuse layer that has a length of the Debye length. So the layer of mobile ions that sits right next to the stern layer is, is movable. And the reason that's important is because I've got this electric field and what happens is the electric field actually moves the ions and slides them along, slides them along the walls of the channel. So essentially what happens is this. As soon as I, as soon as I plug in my battery, initially what I would see is motion, bulk fluid motion along the walls. So if I extrapolate that into 3D, so, um, so fluid near the walls begins to move. So as soon as I plug in my battery, fluid near the wall starts to move these ions are sliding along and if I envision this in 3D I can think about this as an annulus so an entire annulus is sliding down my channel the the diffuse layer nearest the wall now as these ions move 
they begin to drag along the, the fluid that is neighboring it closer inside the channel. So in other words, the fluid friction between the separate layers of fluid drag one another. And so after a while, if I go away and eat lunch and come back and look at my channel, this is what I would see. I would see bulk fluid flow throughout my channel. And again, it's because the layer nearest the wall started moving first and it dragged its neighboring fluid molecules along with it. And over time, they all reach essentially the same speed. And in this scenario, all of my fluid is moving, except very close to the walls. And so this is the phenomenon of electroosmosis, and this is mainly responsible for the bulk fluid motion that I see. All right. <clears throat> so again, this is the movement of the diffuse layer by the external electric field, and this diffuse layer drags along all the other layers. How do I calculate electroosmotic velocity? In a very similar way. So electroosmotic velocity is equal to the electroosmotic mobility times the magnitude of the E field. Now electroosmotic mobility I calculate with a slightly different formula than I used for electrophoresis. Electroosmotic mobility is epsilon times zeta divided by 4 pi nu. So epsilon is again the permittivity of free space times the relative permittivity of the solvent. And then zeta is the zeta potential, and we talked about that in the, in the last lecture about surface charge. This is the potential that's present at the surface of my tubes, my glass tubes for instance, and it's a direct result of the stern layer. And then finally, nu is the solvent viscosity, and this of course depends on the type of fluid. Alcohol or water has a different viscosity than, say, molasses. All right? Okay. So the main points for electroosmosis are twofold. So in a very large channel, <clears throat> in, a very, in, in a channel so with micrometer scale dimensions, if I look at the flow profile, I would see something like this. I would see most of my fluid moving with the same velocity throughout the channel height or width. Now at the edges, it deviates a little bit. Right at the edge of the glass, there is no movement. And so in fact, the velocity there is much slower. And as you might guess, the thickness that that velocity is slower is the Debye length because that's the length where the electrostatic attraction is the largest, is the strongest. This is called a blunt flow profile because it's flat and it's essentially the same throughout the width or the height of the channel. If I shrink my channel down, this is a large channel, if I shrink it down to a nanometer scale, this is what I see. Right? My flow profile becomes much more skewed, so my fastest velocity happens in the middle, and then velocity is much smaller as I get near the sidewalls. And the reason is because my Debye length, my Debye length is a greater fraction of my channel width. And so as a result, I get fast fluid motion only in the middle, slower fluid motion at the walls. Um, and the, the closer to the wall, the slower it gets to, until it gets to the stern layer, at which point it's equal to zero. So main points for electroosmosis and electrophoresis. You can use voltage to pump fluid in micro and nano channels. And this is very neat because you don't need moving parts. Literally, all you need is a nine volt battery, two beakers of salt water, and a capillary attaching them connecting them. And if you stick the battery and the fluid, you will see motion. It works really well in small devices. And in fact, the smaller the device, the shorter the dimensions, the more prominent it becomes.
So the smaller is better in this case. It's, a, it's an effect that grows stronger uh, the smaller you get. However, the opposite is not true and in fact could be dangerous. If you make your channels too large and you put current through them, you can actually get um, excessive heat generation and could even start a fire or cause an explosion depending on the solvents in your system because the larger you make your channel, um, the greater the current, the higher the joule heating, so the higher the, the amount of heat generated. And so, in fact, this, this phenomenon does not work at all at the macro scale. It wouldn't work, for instance, in a foot diameter tube. And so just to summarize, if you want to calculate the velocity due to these two phenomena, all you need to know is the relative mobilities of each, the electroosmotic mobility and the electrophoretic mobility calculated with the equations above, and then you multiply that times the magnitude of your E-field, and that will give you the velocity of your ions and of your fluid. And that concludes this segment.